Hello everyone, my name is Jason Gregson, and this video is going to be an application of basis vectors. So when we introduced the idea of a basis, we said that basis vectors had to have two main properties. One, basis vectors had to span the space. And two, basis vectors had to be linearly independent. And both these properties tell us special things about the basis vectors. The first fact that they have to span the space, this tells us that every vector in the space can be written as a linear combination of the basis vectors because that's what it means to span the space. The second one, the fact that the vectors are linearly independent, tells us that this can be done uniquely. There's only one way to represent a vector in a space as a linear combination of the basis vectors. Together, if we put these two facts together, we see this. If I have some basis, so this is the name of my set of basis vectors, and here they are individually. If this basis is a basis for V, some vector space V, then if V is some vector in our space, then there is one and only one set of numbers such that we can represent V, the vector V, as a linear combination of the basis vectors. So in other words, it's x1, x2, and x3. These are the weights of each of the basis vectors that lead us to this vector V. And the fact that these basis vectors are linearly independent tells us this is the only set of numbers x1, and x2, and x3 that will lead us to. And these weights are special. And so we call x1, x2, and x3 the b coordinates of the vector v. And we notate that with our vector v inside of some square brackets. And then we'd say which basis we are using here. So that indicates the basis. And so in some sense, you could think of these as the directions to the vector v. To get to v, you might travel 2 in this direction, and 3 in this direction, and maybe 4 in this direction. And if you did, you could kind of describe that v just in terms of the directions to get there as 2, 3, 4. All right, let's look at an example. So here we have a basis for R2. So yeah, the basis for R2 is this set. So the first thing we should really ask ourselves is, is this a basis for R2? So if I took both of these vectors and I put them into a little matrix, I could see right away that there is a pivot position for every row. That tells us that this is onto, that it actually does span all of R2. But there's also a pivot position every column. And this tells us these, linear, these vectors are linearly independent. So this really is a basis for R2. Now, if v is 2, 1, so this is a vector inside of R2, what are the b coordinates of the vector v? Now, in this case, it's relatively easy to see because we have a nice basis. I know that this vector 2, 1 is 2 times this basis vector plus 1 times this va basis vector. So these are the directions to get to this vector 2, 1. And so I would say the v coordinates in terms of my basis here would be 2, 1. And you can really think of these as almost the, the points. That's the weighting of each one that we get to. That was straightforward. But let's look at another example. Now we'll start off by looking at a new basis for R2. So we could say, show that this is a basis for R2. Well, once again, I would have to put these into a matrix and maybe do the row reduction. And if I row reduced, I would take R2 minus R1. That would give me 0, negative 1. Then I would take R1 plus R2, which would give me this. And lastly, I would change the sign of R2. Multiply through that by negative 1, which would give me this one. So when I look at this row reduce form, I can see once again there's a pivot position in every row and every column. So these two vector is really our basis for R2. But that means I should be able to take this vector and once again represent it as a linear combination of the basis vectors. And once again, in this case, I can, I can just see what those weightings are. I can see that if I took one of my first basis vector plus one of my second basis vector, the result would really be that 2, 1 vector. So now, if I said what are the coordinates of V, in terms of this new basis, these coordinates would be 1, 1. So here I have the same vector in the vector space, the vector 2, 1, but I'm representing it 
is coordinates are different in terms of different bases. Now visually, what does this look like? Well, if we do a little quick sketch of the coordinate system, one, two, and one, two, we're looking at this spot, two, one, this vector right here. And in the first example, we had these as our basis vectors. We had one, zero, and zero, one. And we learned that the coordinates to get to our vector 2, 1, we would take 2 of this direction and 1 of this direction, and that would bring us exactly to our point. But in the second case, if we used this as our basis vector and this as our basis vector, 1, 1, we could see that if I took 1 of this vector and 1 of the other basis vector, that was another way I could get to this vector 2, 1. So once again, we're ending up in the same place, but we're taking different paths. And you can think of these coordinates as almost like the, the amount in each direction we go. Now two important things to note from that previous example. One, a vector space can have different bases. So it can have infinitely many different bases for a vector space. But some are more convenient to use than others. And oftentimes, we can take a hard problem in one basis and if we think about our vector space in terms of a different basis, then that problem might get easier. The second point to consider is that both of these examples of a basis for our two contained two vectors. And it turns out this isn't a coincidence. In fact, there is a perfect number of basis vectors for every space. And we call this number the dimensions of the space. So in some sense, this dimension tells us the size of the space. When we think about it, if we looked at R2, that would have infinitely many vectors in it. But R3 would also have infinitely many vectors in it. But we consider R3 to be a bigger space. If we drew a little sketch of it, the X, Y, and Z coordinate system, we can see that R3 really contains all of R2 plus many more vectors. So we think of it as a bigger space. Now it turns out that the dimension of R2 is 2. And we've already seen this. We looked at two different examples of a basis for R2, and they both contained two basis vectors. We could also discover that the dimension of R3 is equal to 3. And in fact, we can go farther and say that the dimensions of Rn is n. So why, why is this? Well, if we look at the dimensions of R3 case, if I'm trying to find a basis for R3, I might start to write out some vectors. This might be my first vector. And I might look at a second vector. I say, do I have enough? Could this possibly be a basis for R3? But to determine if it was a basis for R3, I would simply form a matrix and try to find out if there was a pivot position for every row and column. But clearly, if I only have two of these vectors, there can't possibly be a pivot position for every row. That tells me I need at least three vectors to be a basis. So I might add a third vector. In fact, I might add a fourth vector. But if I add a fourth vector, I know that there cannot possibly be a pivot position for every column, in which case these can't be linearly independent. Therefore, this would be too many vectors to be a basis. So in this case, every basis must contain three vectors we can really make that same kind of argument for any vector space Rn. Now the basis that I've displayed here, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, is a special basis. We will call this basis the standard basis. This is a very easy basis to work with. And you can see that if we put those vectors into a matrix, we would get the identity matrix. So in the past, We've also done operations where we've said we want to use the columns of the identity matrix, but really we could say we're doing things in terms of the standard basis. Let's look at one more example. This is going to be a big example. It's going to tie several ideas together. We're given some matrix A that's displayed here. And I have four questions to ask. First, I want to find a basis for the null space of A. So the null space of A is all the solutions to the homogeneous equation. So you should try to solve AX equals zero. So pause the video now and see if you can solve AX equals zero. And then take your solution and write it in parametric form.
parametric vector form. Now you've had time to work on this problem, let's do it together. To solve this equation, I could aug write the augmented matrix where I augment with the zero vector. But because the row reduction doesn't change those values, I can just row reduce the matrix A. To row reduce this matrix A, I'm going to take R2 minus 2R1. And then I'm also going to take R3 minus 3 times R1. And the resulting matrix would have 0, 0, 0 in the second row and 0, 0, 0 in the three, third row. So it's already in R, R, E, F. To write all my solutions, I go back to equation form. That first row would give me the equation x1 plus 2x2 plus 3x3 equals 0. I can still think of that augmented version where I have a 0 on the right-hand side. The next one says 0 equals 0. It also tells me that x2 is a free variable. I can also see that x3 is a free variable. So if I form the parametric vector form of my solution, where I'm trying to give values for x1, x2, and x3 in terms of its free variables, x1 should be equal to minus 2x2 minus 3x3. x2 is just free, and x3 is just free. Now I'll write this out as separate vectors in terms of each of these free variables. I can get x2 times negative 2, 1, 0 plus x3 times negative 3, 0, 1. And so this represents all the possible solutions to the homogeneous equation. But notice that when we write all the possible solutions, the whole null space, they're just a linear combination of these two vectors. So as we can say that those two vectors are a basis for the null space. So my basis for the null space are the vectors negative 2, 1, 0, and negative 3, 0, 1. And now that we've established a basis for the null space, we can go right to question number 2. Because there are two vectors in the basis, the dimensions of the null space is equal to 2. The next problem says, is negative 8, 1, 2 in the null space of A? Now we can certainly take our matrix A and times it by this vector, and if it was in the null space, that product would be the zero vector. So that's one way we could verify whether it's in that or not. Another way would be to find the linear combination of the basis vectors that bring us to negative 8, 1, 2. And in this case, I can see by inspection that if I take one of the first basis vector plus two of the second basis vector, the result is exactly negative 8, 1, 2. Now, of course, if I couldn't see that result, I could always use values x1 and x2 in place of the 1 and the 2, the missing numbers. I could solve that vector equation to find the values of 1 and 2. But here I can just see it. So this tells me that yes, negative 8, 1, 2 is in the null space, and I've actually completed number 4 as well. I have represented it in terms of this basis. But now that I've found these weights, the amount of each basis vector that it takes to get to negative 8, 1, 2, that also tells me that these are the coordinates of negative 8, 1, 2 in terms of this basis. So if I gave this basis a name, I will call it script B. And if I gave this vector a name, I'll call that vector V, then that vector in terms of this basis is equal to 1, 2. 1, 2 are the unique directions to get to this vector v in terms of this basis. And so it's a unique re representation for negative 8, 1, 2. Now notice that there's only two components to the coordinates for this vector, even though this vector has three components. That's because the dimension of the null space is only 2. So we can see that although our vectors of the null space live in R3, we can uniquely represent them with their coordinates, which live in R2. And so we could really take every vector in the null space and map, and map it or associate it to a vector in R2. This relationship between the null space and R2 is a one-to-one -one mapping that preserves the linear combinations. And so we call this kind of mapping an isomorphism. Or we say that the null space here is isomorphic to R2. And so we can really visualize the null space as that R2 vector space. 
Alright, so in this problem we really tie together a lot of ideas about basis and dimension and coordinates. And we'll work on some more problems as we move forward, but that concludes this video. Thank you.